So um, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, psychological preparation. You know, you're, you're well fed, you have great nutrients in your system, and now you have to treat the, the brain and the mind, right? So um, I always like this. Does anyone know Joe Friel? He's like the number one coach, and uh, he wrote the Bible. Well, the biker's Bible, I should say. Sorry. <laughs> Cyclist Bible. And uh, he's not that old. <laughs> so he wrote the Cyclist Bible, and he's just really amazing. And he responds right away to your emails. I emailed him yesterday, and he just got right back to me, which was great. I was uh, very impressed. So uh, a quote from him is, the little rocks, even the sand particles, become increasingly important as the absolute performance of the athlete improves. At the highest level of sport, everything is a big rock. So there's no room for anything to be done haphazardly for a world-class athlete, especially one who makes a living from competing. But that isn't the way for the rest of us. So um, you know, I, just, I, I was just impressed with the, the way he put it. And uh, you know, when you're out there and you're an elite athlete, um, you know, nothing can be left to chance. Everything has to be thought out and planned for. But for the rest of us, it's, you know, we just have to watch out for the big rocks, not the sand particles. <laughs> but uh, I thought that was a really impressive quote. Um, and one of the topics is going to be mental toughness. Um, it's a very popular term used now in sports psychology. It's also being used in business, military, uh, Navy SEALs, etc. But mental toughness is kind of like a sexy term in cycling, and it's, um, it's been reported to be the most important psychological characteristic in excellence and performance. Uh, this is a quote from uh, the UK University of Wales. If anybody wants the um, sources of any of my quotes or uh, research studies, I'll be happy to provide them. Uh, I'll give you my email. So this is the definition of mental toughness. It's having the natural or developed psychological edge that enables you to cope better than all your opponents um, and also to be more consistent and better. Um, and I underscore consistent as well. Consistency is very important. And, um, and you're, better you're more determined, you're more focused, you're more confident, and you're more in control under pressure. Now that's a tall order. <laughs> that's, that's pretty tough to accomplish, but uh, I underlined develop because it can be developed. Some people have that mental toughness and they seem to be, it's in the DNA, but with uh, most people it's developed. It can be trained. So I just wanted to stress that. There's a number of uh, researchers and writers and coaches who have defined mental toughness and some of them have a common denominator. Um, and I just picked out a few. One is, uh, Joe says, uh, paying meticulous attention to goals. That's uh, long-term and short-term. Having a burning desire to stay ahead of your competition. Being internally focused rather than externally focused. Focus is probably the most common denominator in all the definitions of mental toughness. Focus is, is really important. Uh, not to be distracted. Uh, by others, including your competition. And uh, I think that the shrugging off failures is extremely important. Uh, there's a number of athletes, I could, there's a lot of Olympic stories of people who have had just horrible, horrific experiences happen to them. And I'm thinking of the diver in 2012 who, um, you know, sliced her head basically on the, uh, on the concrete platform. Uh, became unconscious, hit the water unconscious. Her husband, jump, her, who happens to be her coach, jumped in and rescued her, and she survived it. And then she saw a psychiatrist because of the trauma. And a year later, she was performing again. She was back in the Olympics. So, I mean, for people to be able to rebound from defeat is resiliency, really. And, um, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, masters of compartmentalization, I think most athletes are, uh, especially if you're buried, you have children, you're working full time and you're doing research, you're doing this, you're doing that. I think uh, most people are. I think the next one's very important um, about self-criticism. 
a lot of people really beat up on themselves when they make a mistake. Um, and they ruminate, and it stays with them for a long time. Sometimes we call it flypaper. You know, uh, it just doesn't go away. And uh, I went to a, a seminar, well, a, a presentation by Dalai Lama at uh, Radio City. And one of the questions that was sent to him by the audience was, uh, what can you do about self-criticism? So he's talking to his translator, and they're going back and forth and back and forth. I have no idea what they're saying. And after a long pause, the translator explains to the audience that Dalai Lama is saying, what is self-criticism? Why would you do that? Why, why, why would anyone do that to themselves? It was such a foreign concept to him. Why would people do that? So it's like, it's just something we, you know, it, well, I could go into that. That's a whole nother lecture. <laughs> but um, also having relentless focus on long-term goals as well as short-term. And um, I'm not going to go through all 12 attributes of mental toughness, but I thought the first one was very important, and that is just accepting that competition anxiety is inevitable and knowing that you can cope with it. Because once you accept it and know that it's inevitable, um, it kind of helps you live with it and cope with it. And there's, there's a lot more, and I can always uh, send them to you. You can always email me. Um, and... There's one more thing about um, remaining fully focused. Uh, let's see. Yeah, number eight. Remaining fully focused in the, pa in the face of personal distractions. And I think that's, that's really important. And uh, one, Daniel Brown at Harvard, PhD, he's, um, he's studied in Tibet for a number of years, and he's also translated ancient Sanskrit, and he's well published. Um, he talks about focusing on the task, not the outcome. Is if you focus in the moment on the task and, and specifically on what you're trying to achieve and not the outcome, like winning or losing, or then you will succeed. Because the story he so told us was in a workshop one weekend in Boston was um, they had uh, he told a story about a, a young college guy that had been recruited to for baseball, and in in college he was a, a heavy hitter. He he was a great hitter. And then he was recruited, and all of a sudden he was missing the ball, baseball. And they couldn't figure out why. So uh, Daniel Brown is a psychologist. So he met with them, and he said that, uh, he asked the young man, what is it that you think about when, when the ball's being pitched to you? What, what's going through your mind? And the kid said something like, well, I'm, I think about if the pitcher's going to hit it this way, I'm going to react this way if he hits it over here throws, uh, pitches it over here, I'm going to hit that way. And he said, stop, just stop, cut it, you know, time out. Just focus only on the ball. That's all you focus on. You don't think about how you're going to achieve it. You just focus on the ball. And he started hitting. So if you focus only on the target, you're good. Okay. To compete, you need um, resiliency. And what we mean by that is coping with negative outcomes. And even, in, even with, if you do have a failure, continuing to strive. Competitive desire has to be a burning desire. We all know that. Uh, as I said, focus is a common denominator and self-confidence. It has to be unshakable. Uh, a few quotes from uh, other studies. Uh, during competition, all athletes have, and we're talking like Olympic style here, um, the same physical strength and skills, but what makes them different is that their ability to overcome competition pressure. That's the key. Um, and then Michael Johnson is a track star. Uh, and this is, uh, which I was talking about focus earlier. And he just simply focuses on the track. And everything else disappears. You know, and you, I'm sure you've heard of flow, where everything is timeless. And, you, and it's just, it just happens. They say it just happens. Um, so, to improve mental toughness, um, control uh, and performance imagery, visual imagery is, is a good um, tool, good strategy. Actually playing out the, the ride or in your mind visually and in a relaxed state. Uh, total commitment to enhance your performance. Also, tennis stars have done a lot of visualizations. And uh, golfers, Nicholas, 
uh, so forth, do the visual visualization, and then uh, also coping strategies for the anxiety. One of those happens to be breathing. I mean, br you take breathing for granted, but breathing, you know, it, you really have to look at how you breathe because shallow breathing is not good. But deeper breathing is, means everything. It puts you in complete control. Um, oh, I see. <laughs> I got it. I uh, couldn't talk about cycling and not talk about pain because pain is part of cycling. It's just a given. And as my son said, if I, Aaron, if I don't have pain, I don't feel like I've ridden. It's not a good ride. He does centuries. He does, you know, this every day almost. So uh, he is used, quite used to pain. So um, Jonathan Vodder, he spoke at NYU on a panel, right, uh, recently. So um, he talks about how important it is to embrace the pain. Just accept the fact that you're going to have pain and, um, and that no training method is painless or suffer free. That, and and in, in relative to that, he's talking about climbing, mostly about climbing. Um, and I just, I, I just found a great quote that says, uh, what you resist persists. So if you resist the pain mentally, it, it will persist because you'll be distracted by it. So, and I, I know physicians might disagree with me on, <laughs> on pain, but, uh, but uh, you know, I'm just talking about in regular writing. So uh, some athletes say that they, they perform well in practice, but they don't understand why they fall apart in competition. Um, there's, first of all, there's increased emotionality. There's a lot of physi physiological arousal, nervousness, and so forth. Uh, yet some athletes are able to control emotions and maintain a positive attitude and they expect to succeed. So that, again, that goes back to mental toughness. And then um, Lohr says that as an athlete pursues through the, proceeds through their career, they become more mentally tough because they become more conditioned to handling the intense pressure of competition. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, psychological constructs that I wanted to just briefly mention is one is learned helplessness by Seligman. I'm sure you've heard of it. And it's, um, uh, the idea is to have, um, that when you have success, if, I'm sorry, you have more success when failure is attributed to external factors. So if you feel that your success happened because of, um, I mean, if you feel that your failure happened because of external factors, then it's, it's better for you, and you have a more optimistic view about yourself, and you'll have more success. And it's also better if you feel that success is attributed to internal factors. So if you say, I won that race because I was just lucky, that's an external factor. That's not a good thing. So really, um, really feel free to, to attribute success to yourself. Uh, Self-efficacy by Bandura is the belief that you possess the necessary skills required to produce the desired outcome. In other words, you have the skills, you just need the practice, you need the training. Um, resiliency, of course, is coping with negative outcomes uh, and knowing that failure is not permanent uh, and that in, if you do have a flop, then just know that it's, it's temporary and um, you move on, you just move forward, you let it go. And uh, the also achievement in the face of adversity. And I couldn't come up with a better example than the Olympic diver. And by the way, she also had a death in the family before that also. Uh, during that time, her 16-year-old brother was killed. Um, I don't know, he was at a restaurant or something and was in a bar and was hit and uh, he died. Uh, so three months later, she was on her way back to the uh, championships. So I won't go through all these. Um, on the right is psychological strategies uh, in order to build the attributes on the left. And so uh, the one I'll, I'll focus on is remaining fully focused in face of distractions. So the strategy for that would be mental imagery, uh, pre-performance routine. How many people have a pre-performance ritual? No one? One, okay. Two, three, okay. A friend of mine does fencing. She competes nationally. And 
believe it or not, her pre-performance ritual is listening to um, Lady Gaga. She, she disappears in the corner for a little while, and she just uh, she loves Alejandro. So she listens to Alejandro, and that's for some reason that calms her. I, I don't know. It's, it's a lovely song, but I don't know. It's, uh, and then she wins. I mean, she, she's number one so, uh, for her age group, I should say. <laughs> for her age group, she's number one uh, in the U.S. So uh, everyone should have a pre-performance ritual, and it has to be individualized, something that's meaningful to you. It could be a song. It could be, um, you know, jumping jacks. I mean, it, it could be, you know, if you look at the Art of Living Foundation, they have tremendous uh, breathing techniques. Uh, you know, I won't go through them now because it looks weird, but anyway, uh, they work. And uh, everyone has their own ritual that they, and it's very, very powerful, very powerful stuff. Okay, uh, strategies to create a mindset, visualization. We talked about mentally rehearsing the moves. Positive self-statements, affirmations. I'm the greatest. Who did that? Uh, Muhammad Ali, right? So, you know, some people yell at the top of their voice. They run outside and they yell, I'm the best. And then they run back in. So, uh, you know, what, whatever works, whatever works for you, whatever you're, you know, I'm getting faster, I'm getting, I'm cycling harder, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just good. Uh, mindfulness, of course, is being fully present. A lot of people talk about mindfulness uh, being present in the moment, completely present in the moment. And some people talk about hearing their tires against the road. I, I found it when I was, when I did the marathon, the pitter-patter on the 59th Street Bridge of all the sneakers. I just became very mindful of that, and it was just very soothing. It was really nice. Um, it's a great sound. Uh, but being very much in the present, and by the way, these are not just strategies for exercise, not just strategies for competing, but they're strategies for life. Um, goal setting, short term, long term, uh, having the pre-performance ritual, whatever that is for you. Uh, meditation, they have studies. Uh, a number of studies in India as well as uh, in Massachusetts. It seems like all these studies come out of Massachusetts. Um, but they know that meditation enhances concentration. So um, it's a good thing to practice. And also the various breathing techniques. Practicing breathing um, in a very, uh, the um, abdominal breathing, not, not shallow in the lungs. Because when babies, if you watch a little baby sleep, they're, they, and, they t and they're breathing, they're, their bellies fill up, right? It's not up here, it's in their belly. So it's something we kind of kind of uh, undo over time, I guess, with stress and whatever. So you, there are questionnaires online about mental toughness, assessing your own mental toughness. Do you know what your strengths are? Do you know what your vulnerability, uh, vulnerabilities? Have you developed strategies for them? What about injuries, other setbacks, and are you the type of person that bounces back easily? So a lot of this is self-awareness, um, and in, these are questions that I would ask if I was working with someone in uh, optimizing their performance. Okay, I can't uh, talk about optimizing performance without mentioning flow. I'm sure most, how many people have heard of flow? Most of you have. Um, it's a skill to challenge flow ratio. Uh, basically, it's um, boredom is uh, you're just really bored and you need to find challenges. That's the solution. The anxiety, if the anxiety is too high, you won't perform well. If the boredom is too high, you won't perform well. So you have to find that middle ground where you just have just enough anxiety and, just, and, and hopefully no boredom. So that's why you have to keep finding challenges. Um, Ch Chiksetsa Mihai, <laughs> I always mess up his name. Chiksetz and Mihai has a book called Flow. I highly recommend it. It's a great book. And um, it's not just, again, in his book, he's not just talking about a, a high achievers. He's talking about life in general, that no matter what you do, uh, you can find ways to reduce your anxiety, find, find ways to uh, increase. What he says, really, is to increase your challenges in life. And you can do that with any mundane task. And I've tried it. It's really interesting to do because you become so much joyful. Uh, let's say you have a routine task that you just dread doing, you hate doing. Let's say the dishes. 
But if you challenge yourself to whatever, set the timer, do it in less than five minutes, or if you try to think of your, you're serving the community by doing the dishes. <laughs> I mean, you can do all kinds of things to, to make things more interesting, more exciting, and more challenging. So, okay, that's uh, Shasetha Mihai. Uh, his book, Flow, I highly recommend it again. I just, I, I can't say that enough. Uh, he, he stresses transforming adversity into challenge. Uh, your goals have to be uh, clear, well-defined, and uh, your feedback has to be immediate. So the sooner you have the feedback, um, the better. And intense focus, what he means by that is disassociation of everything else. You have to focus on that one thing only. Uh, and I know people pride themselves in multitasking, but we're talking about a different kind of focus here um, in training. Confidence, and then he also talks about being in the flow state is an altered time sense. People say that everything disappears. Their concept of time disappears when they're in the flow or they're in the zone, that there's no, no time. It's just a very strange state to be in, but everyone says that when they perform, the professional athletes say it, it just happens. That in the beginning when they're training, they're worried about everything, they're worried about becoming competent, but then after they master everything, it just happens. It just, it's quite remarkable. They, they say it, it, it becomes, uh, a skater had said, it be, everything becomes just automatic and you just do it. There's not, a, and artists say that too, also dancers, um, ballet dancers and so forth. They just, it's, everything's automated. And to wrap up, a quote, um, Give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. Teach a man to cycle, and he'll realize fishing's stupid and boring. <laughs> so, so I hope I'm not offending any fishermen here or fisherwomen. But <laughs> anyway, uh, my email is bonnie.marks at nyumc.org if you have any questions. And thank you. Okay.